Hey, Tommy, I love the topic of this podcast. What are we talking about today? Yeah, that's right. So this is the top 10 least satisfying cars. And did me and you pick that? Did Nathan <laughs> scroll down the list of cars he hates and uh, pen a list? Where did this come from? No, so Consumer Reports is all this data from their Consumer Reports member survey. And uh, basically, they asked their members, would you buy this car again if given the choice? And it's essentially a list that sees if the vehicle lived up to their expectations. And then that, you know, translates into satisfaction. So these are the top 10 least satisfying cars. Yeah, they've got the dubious distinction of half, at least half the owners who bought this car would not buy it again. That's saying a lot, actually, when you think about it. Yeah, I, it's uh, pretty interesting. And number one on this list was super surprising from a brand that you don't typically think of uh, dissatisfying. But we'll get to that here in a second. Yeah, let me give you guys a hint, though. I'll give you a hint before we get to that list. They're all crossovers, aren't they? There are a couple sedans in there. All right, all right never mind. Yep. Most of them are crossovers. Yep. Um, so before we get to that, we're going to have a Roman's rant that we're going to talk about. Maybe we'll do that after we talk about the vehicle that I just test drove, which is the new Lexus LX600, Tommy. I just got back from a wonderful trip to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I got to take it on and off road. Uh, and if you're curious about, well, that vehicle, I've already put a first walk around. And, you know, I, I took a lot of um, gump Took a lot of gump, Tommy, from uh, the viewers when I put that video up. And by the way, if you want to keep up on all of our videos, just uh, get the little web app, tfl-studios.com. It goes, look, there's Blazy. It goes as a web app to your phone, and it basically consolidates all of our seven YouTube channels, our podcasts, our TikToks, our news, and that way you can you know, pick and choose whatever stuff you want to watch or listen to. Uh, but yeah, I took a lot of uh, grief, and I, undeservedly so. Can I tell you a story? Sure. So um, there are now uh, three versions of the LX. Let, actually, let me take a step back. So once upon a time, Toyota used to import the Land Cruiser. Do you love? We both love that, right? No? Don't love the Land Cruiser? I'm not sure I love it. I, 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 I think it's an important piece of off-road history, and I'm going to get probably flames in the comments, but I'm, I'm not sure I, I love it. How could you not love it? We well, had one. We had the 200 little, series. It was a little soulless. I like the old ones. The old ones, like the 60 and the 80 series, love them. The newer ones have just been like... Too, they're, they're too perfect. There's so much mechanical perfection in there that some of the excitement is lost. But anyways, people love them. This is coming from a guy who got to drive all of them, including the Iron Pig. Is that the right? Which is why I determined I love the old ones. But anything post-100 series, even the 100 series, I'm a little bit like... For thirty-five, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars, you can have more fun and still have some reliability. Anyway, it's an iconic car, and for whatever reason, Toyota built a new three hundred series and decided not to bring it uh, to America. So uh, it's built on the same assembly line and the same plant as the LX six hundred. So our version of the Land Cruiser, unfortunately, or fortunately, if you're a Lexus fan, is now the LX six hundred, and they've done some crazy things. First of all, it's expensive, Tommy. So it starts at eighty-six thousand dollars, and that's for the two row or five passenger get this there's also a three row seven passenger or and i'm not making this up there is the ultra luxury that's what they're calling it for a hundred and twenty six thousand and you know tommy like these big three row um suvs are having their moment in the light right now people are really loving them so it competes with you know like the grand wagoneer uh the navigator the yukon the tahoe the escalade uh the armada even maybe like the uh range rover autobiography anyway the ultra luxury is a four seater, right? Sure. Uh, and so I, I did this video doing a walk around of it because I thought it was the most interesting. And basically, the back seat like reclines like a first class airplane seat. Uh, and then this little thing comes down for your feet. The, for, the seat kind of goes forward, uh, and then you can massage that seat. And I was doing this in the video by myself. Didn't have a videographer, so I was kind of doing it all one one take style. Uh, and then I couldn't get the front seat to come back. Okay. Uh, and all the comments were like, hey, Roman, you should really get to know the car before you do the video. So people felt like I was fumbling around. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and I, I accept that. But come to find out, it was a pre-production model. Oh. And, and because I read those comments, I went to Toyota. I'm like, hey, how do you push this front seat back? And they're like, oh, sorry, you can't. Oh, it didn't work, huh? So you got to go and actually physically use the little controls on this pre-production model on the front seat. There you have it. So so I'm just doing a little, like, you know, explanation. I wasn't that uh, stumbly through it. 
I feel like that was a pretty dull story, Dan. <laughs> it was all this buildup, and then the, the story was the seat wouldn't move. All right, all right. Well, let me, let, let me, let me spice it up a little bit. So we went off-road with it, and a tiger had gotten loose from the zoo. There you go. That's a little better. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. And I got in the car, and guess what was sitting in the passenger seat next to me? <laughs> what? Nick Miles. There you go. <laughs> not, not the tiger. Was that a spicier story? That was a spicier story. Yeah, let's and, lead on with that one. Anyway, this vehicle is interesting. I think they're going to sell well. It's expensive. It's 86000 all the way up to $126,000. Uh, uh, driving Im- impressions are embargoed, so I can't really talk about how it drives. But the cool thing about it is it does have all the off-road tech that you'd expect. So it has, um, I don't think it's hydraulic suspension, right? Land Cruisers don't have air suspension. Well, I don't know what they did. So the on the old one, yeah. Um, if you got the Land Cruiser, you had steel springs, yeah. And then if you had the Lexus version, you had the height adjustable. That's what this has with, with the height control. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think eight points, eight point nine inches of ground clearance, four inches of suspension travel. Uh, four multi- inches. Four inches of yeah. Four, oh, I, up and down. Up and down. Oh, not suspension travel. <laughs> of, of hydraulic height adjustability. Yeah, four inches. So I don't think it goes from eight point nine four inches up from there. But in general, the the, the, the range is four inches. Uh, toes uh, up to ninth, eight to nine thousand. Gets nineteen mpg combined because they swapped out the engine. Right, it used to be the old. 5.7 liter V8. Now it's a 3.5 liter twin turbo, the same one that is in the Tundra. Yeah. You don't seem excited. Well, I just like the. the uh, not what? really excited, actually. Really? Well, what's the point of having all this off road gear if you're going to have 22s on a Lexus with the front spoiler that's three inches off the ground? It, it does come standard with 20s, but the ones I was driving all had 22s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they did have, like I say, multi terrain. It has a low range, yeah, of course. That's great. That's it does great. a thing where it drags a rear wheel if it's you want to. It's fantastic, but you can't dig it off road because the running boards well, are I did. I did. giant plastic things. Yeah, they are. And the front end is super low and aggressive, and it's got these big shiny exhaust tips, and it's ninety thousand dollars. I mean, it's like why even put the off-road stuff in it? It has the biggest spindle grill I've ever seen. It's ridiculous. On, I, it's huge. It's like I, I, you know, I'm doing my arm thing right now. You know how when you go fishing and you kind of exaggerate how big the fish is that, that got away. Well, this is that exaggeration, but even bigger. It's 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 just humongous. So if you love that new kind of BMW huge nose fascia thing. The Lexus has it in spades. If you're going to do an off-roader, then then do an off-roader, but don't add, don't pretend it's an off-roader, and then put 22s on it. I have a big problem with that. Just like if you're going to do an off-roader, bring the, the Land Cruiser in. This is not an acceptable substitute. So let me ask you this: Do you think people will buy a four-seater LX600? Do you think this is actually something that people are going to go at, or is this just something they built for like like Saudi Arabia or wherever? You know that is. In, I mean, for me. Having airplane style first class seating where it completely reclines, right? And where you can put your feet up on it, it has massaging. That, that to me belongs like in an S class uh, sedan and not necessarily, or maybe even like, uh, I don't know, like, like the Maybach, right? But this is, this is what they're going after now. What a 1970s viewpoint there. Really? Well, because everyone's buying SUVs. Like, autobiography yeah. Range Rovers are, are, like, the go-to Beverly Hill vehicle. Okay. I, I think at one point, yeah, if you go back 10, 15 years, it used to be all sedans, right? Right. But now everybody wants SUVs. So why can't SUVs have a four-seater so, ultra-luxury? So you Even think- Maybach, the new Maybach that they've been pushing, is a GLS 600, which is a... Uh, a four-seater SUV. So you think that they're going to sell like hotcakes, a $126,000 four-seater No, they're not going to sell truck. like hotcakes, but they're going to sell a few of them. Yeah. I, I just, like, I was so bummed out by the LX, right? The the Land Cruiser abroad, you can get it with locking diffs and small wheels and a basic stripped-down version. And, of course, in the U.S., we got this big, gussied-up, fancy thing, which is fine. It's a good vehicle. It's going to last a super long time, and it's going to be very comfy. Well, but I'm, I'm just bummed that it's not a Land Cruiser because I love the Land Cruiser. I exactly. Think, I think, you know... Ugh. God, sorry, Lexus, but you know, if 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 it were me, I'd uh-huh. go get the Heritage Edition Land Cruiser if you can still find one for sale somewhere. Oh, I think they're all sold out though. I, I heard there were still some because dealers were asking over stickers, so you could spend easily hundred thousand on that. But that would be the one I'd get with that cool like old school st- script that says Land Cruiser on it, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so yeah, that, that would be my suggestion. So shall we get to our uh, topic du jour? Yeah, the issue with the least satisfying cars I, I have come to figure out is that it's unfortunately a, a pretty unsatisfying list. Why is that? Because I, don't, I just I don't because think the we cars have, are least. We don't have a lot to say about a lot of these cars. Well, sure. I mean, have we driven all of them? Uh, oh, at one point. Yeah. 
But um, when is the last time you drove our number 10 car? What is our number? All right, what, all right number 10. Yeah, it, Kia Forte. Uh, not that long ago. So uh, what was the percentage of people who said they wouldn't buy a Kia Forte? So Consumer Reports actually has it listed differently. Okay. It's the percentage of people that would buy it again. Okay. So 47% of people said they would buy a Kia Forte So again. less than half. Less than half, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, look, the Kia Forte, there's nothing wrong with the Kia Forte, right? It's basic, uh, used to be affordable transportation, uh, but there was certainly nothing that, that, that would like make me want to like run out of my house and go buy one immediately. You know what I'm saying? There's nothing compelling about it. It's, it's a fine car. It'll last a long time. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of right down the middle. So if you want something that's going to get you to work and back, uh, but necessarily won't necessarily impress your friend friends. I mean, that's a fine car, but you're right. It's not like, I don't know what else to say about it. It's, there's nothing like terrible about it, and there's nothing terribly great about it. I'm embarrassed to say I know almost nothing about the Kia Forte. Really? Well, we've never it's had cute. it. We've never had the new one as a loaner. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I just like, I, I feel like they put a lot of effort into marketing the Elantra. I've driven yep. the Elantra. It's fantastic. The Forte is the one below it. No, it isn't. I thought the Ford is it's Elan- a different Elan- brand. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I meant Hyundai. <laughs> it competes with the Elantra. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, See, you don't know much about the Forte either. Here, it's confusing because let's face it, Hyundai and Kia rebrand their cars, uh, and a lot of them are, are you know the same version with a different bag. I think that you can get it with the two hundred one horsepower engine, which is cool. That's good. That is all I have to say about the Forte. All right, well, let's go. I'm sorry. I, I really well, apologize well, well, to our listeners. No, I just don't, I don't know much about the Forte. I, I don't think you need to apologize. I think this is exactly the reason why only 47% said they would buy it again, right? Like you go to your buddy and you're like, hey, dude, you won't believe what I just picked up. And he's like, what? Did you get, you know, a, uh, I don't know, a Raptor? He goes, no, 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 no Raptor. I got a Kia Forte, dude. And he's like, oh, okay. It's good. cheap. I'll give it that. It starts at 19 grand, which yeah. appears to be less than its competition. So that's good. Yeah, that's that's all. It's all, it was a 2021 top safety pick apparently. <laughs> now I'm just reading the website, but uh, well, hundred year, hundred thousand mile warranty. What more do you warranty. want? You want some spice in your uh, well, I sandwich? Think huh? If I recall, you, couldn't you, wa- you? You want some spicy barbecue sauce could, sprinkled into you your the, pulled pork sandwich? Couldn't you get the GT in a, in a manual? I think that was a good thing about but it. I don't think they're talking to people who are buying. Consumer Reports is not talking to people who are buying Kia. Look, look, look. Uh, I mean, if you're going to go down, if it were my money, right, and I was going to get like an affordable hatchback, I would go. Well, it's and, not a hatchback. No, no, sedan. <laughs> See, you don't know anything about I, the fourth thing. No, 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 no. We're no, over no, here no, just no, like. Hold on, hold on. Hatchback, sedan. Figuring this out as we go along. My, let me finish my <laughs> sentence, would you? <laughs> I would go with the N-Line with the Hyundais, right? So you can get the N in three vehicles now. Pick any of those three. Pick the Kona, which is the hatchback. Pick the, uh, well, that's a crossover. (laughs) Pick the Veloster, which is the hatchback. Or pick the Elantra N, which is the sedan. And you're going to be happy with any of those three. And you're going to want to buy it again because they are the spicy uh, meatball in the spaghetti. Let's just, let's just. Why take, are you making fun of me? Let's just take the L on this, Dad. There's, hey, there's hey, guys, not much we know if, about if the listen, Kia. If, if you're listening to this and you're not watching this, Tommy has two computer computers in front of him right now. And, of, and he's <laughs> furiously Googling Kia and, and making, making me look like an idiot because all I have right here is my phone and I'm trying to be too considerate to actually go and look these things up on my phone. I'm trying to give the folks of the audience uh-huh. something interesting uh-huh. to say uh, about yeah, a yeah, very so you're, dull you're, car. You're furiously Googling on two computers and then you're making fun of me because, you know, I, I, I messed up two sister cars that are basically the same thing from the you know manufacturer with different brands on them um i just think that we need to accept that we need to take the l on the forte i think that was a very bad segment we did there i do apologize well, i think it was little... bad I think, I think it was we fine. don't know anything about the forte well we know that it's number 10 on this is what this <laughs> list is we, we you want me to personally pick up my phone and call ten thousand people and find out how they like their fortes no but i we should know more about the forte this this is what we do we report you know, on organizations that do this kind of work. We, we can't be doing it all. You know, we're doing eye gauntlet testing. Oh, it was just updated for 2022. Yeah. Wow, we really should know. Well, that's not the one that people uh, uh, aren't satisfied on with. On Car Driver, it's got a refreshed look. I'm just saying. With that. new front bumpers. 
It's that, but that's not the one that Consumer Reports is. It's the same. Co- I mean, it's this. It's a, just a light update, though. All right, well, go to number nine, would you? All right, that was a disaster. No, it wasn't. I'm, you, I'm you, taking you. the L on that one. I I admit that we at least I do not know much about the Forte. You, you you can't expect us to be doing what Consumer Reports does. This is this. They do an exceptional job. I listen to their podcast every week. But people come I love, here. I love the team there, and you know, as a journalist, <laughs> I'm I'm like you know, I, hopefully I am a, a jack of all trades, right? My job is to know just enough to report the facts and get them right. It is not to actually do the satisfaction surveys. I'm not saying we do that, but we should have known more about the Forte. Right, yeah. and I've never driven a Forte. Um, so the next car on our list, which I think we'll know a little bit more about, is the Cadillac XT4. I was at the launch of the Cadillac XT4. Yeah, so it replaced, I think, the... Um, I, I, I did a video on it. Oh, apparently I don't know much about the XT4. <laughs> I, I, I drove it. Why in. are all these boring cars on the least satisfying well, list? I wonder why, huh? Oh, I wonder why. Oh, this is the smaller version of the XT5. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, what basically Cadillac did is, a, honey, I shrunk the kids, the XT5. Uh, and I like the design language of it. You know, um, it's, kind of the, it's, got, it's kind of got that, um, I call it the Lexus NX problem, right? Where, like, the RX uh, was super popular, because it's actually it's Lexus's most popular car. So let's take it down a couple segments and make it smaller. But by doing that, you lose the magic of it, which is a vehicle that kind of fits all lifestyles, right? Now you're taking a car that, and I'm talking about the XT5 or the XT4 or the RX or the NX. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. You're taking a car that, that you can use to bring the kids to school or go on vacation with or drive to work and then take your colleagues out to lunch and turning it into like, uh, a first car in the premium segment for newlyweds, where it's them and their little baby chihuahua. And that's the problem. They're just both too small. Wow. Yeah. I know a lot about that car. So, but the deal, <laughs> first of all, you did do a much nicer job with the XT4. You really got that down. But I don't think you can say the reason it doesn't sell is it's small. I mean, it's like... No, it's, it's RAV4 size, and RAV4 is the best-selling well, well, car it's, in, it's in America. A, what does CUV stand for? I'm, I'm going I'm to put you Crossover on. utility. Right. And when you take the U, the utility, out of it, what do you got? You got a CV, right? So you, all of a sudden, just because you give it all-wheel drive doesn't make it a utility vehicle. It just makes it a little bit more you know, sellable in places like Colorado. But when you take the utility out of it, and for some reason both this Cadillac and, you know, the other segment competitors, and you can talk about the Mercedes as well, right, the GLA. The only one that actually bucks that trend is the GLB. So your argument is that it's unsatisfying because it's too small. It doesn't fit. It doesn't. That is a Big Mac American argument right there if I've ever heard one. My my argument is. It doesn't sell because it's done be too small. These cars are the Swiss army knife of vehicles and they suit a lot of different people in a lot of, you know, like like your mom. Like your mom is a perfect example of that, right? She she drives, my my wife, your mom, right? She drives an X5. It's a massive vehicle and she drives it by herself. But if you were to ask her, you know, would you want an X1, an X2, an X3? She'd be like, absolutely not. She needs the room no, of the X5. She, she likes the status of the X5. She I likes the she number likes the room. on the back. She what likes is, throwing what, her bike in the what back. What is the best-selling vehicle in America? The best-selling vehicle, Ford F-150. And what is the, the best-selling car or SUV? Um, so the, as the uh, RAV4 right now. That's the best-selling. And did you know the RAV4 is the exact same length as the X-T4. Yeah, I just don't think it's packaged the same way. <laughs> I don't. I, I, you know, I, I felt, when, when I was in that car, I just felt like it was too small when I was doing that review. I remember driving it around thinking to myself. I mean, it's not an F- F-150, but it's a good size. Eh, I don't know. And it's also the other problem with it is like, it's like, what you, like, like you're, hey, hey, guess what? Once again, here's a conversation with your buddy, right? Yeah. Right? Um, I just bought a new car. What'd you buy, Stan? Oh, I bought an XT4 and uh, couldn't afford an XT5, right? That that's the other thing you're saying. Like, you, you, like, like there's a better version of that car that that you quite couldn't afford, so you went with a smaller version. It has more passenger volume than the Rav4. I'm just <laughs> saying not, the people are cross shopping a Rav4. I with know, but XT4. I'm just saying if people are buying the Rav4 and are satisfied, not a, the Rav4 is not a premium car. Mm, I don't know, Dad. I, I'm not sure. What's, I agree what's with the best-selling the... Subaru? Forester. Right, and what what makes or oh, okay, one of those two? What it makes it so room? It's all about room, right? Well, the XT4 is a Forester it's not, size. It's not, but it's not the same. <laughs> it's size. the same size. It's about utility. Those are very utilitarian vehicles. This thing is a luxurious vehicle that happens to have, you know, not as much room as its bigger brother. Anyway, enough of the Cadillac. Right. It's it's a fine car. 
you know, go check out my reviews. I just, I, this is like, the Forrester does have a lot of interior volume, by the way. Mm. This is like one of the things that I think that we need to get over. This is just my personal vendetta okay, what's against your, what's, Merck. Is, is this Tommy's rant now? It's Tommy's rant. Oh. Everything's got to be bigger. Go. We got to have more room. We're going to have 19 kids and 24 dogs back here. But reality, it's just... 90% of the time, it's one person driving to work by themselves. You know, the, the Why sm- do you need so much room? The smartest thing I, I heard, and I think this is absolutely true, uh, and I forget what podcast I heard it on, so whoever said it, I wish I could give you credit, but I'm going to steal it as my own. Uh, they said that people buy a car based on 5% of the things they're going to do with it. And I agree, that's 100% true. Not the 95 things that they're actually going to do with it, 5% that they think they're going to do with it. So people buy a truck like a Raptor based on, you know, running uh, the Baja 500, right, versus actually ever going off-road with it. I think that, uh, I also heard this on a podcast, I think this sums up perfectly. Europeans buy the smallest car they can live with. Yes. Which is why families are in, like, little hatchbacks, right? Because they they look at their lives and they say, we can make this work with the Gulf. Americans buy the biggest car they can afford. And I think that's a great way of looking at it. Depending on your budget, a lot of Americans buy based on size. And I just like, I hate how cars get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, of course, we end up with crazy and crazier new technologies to try to get fuel economy down. You want to get fuel economy down, just make a smaller car, right? It's going to be lighter weight. It's going to be more aerodynamic. And for the 99% of the time that you're just cruising around by yourself, it's better. I, I'm, that is my Tommy rant. Yeah, you know what, you know the solution to that? What? Just buy a lot of different cars. Just buy a Mini. How about that? We just all buy vintage <laughs> Minis and then rent rent a U-Haul van yeah. for our trips that we take. Not that we can buy any cars right now. And we know that. So I'm just being kind of I'm being kind of uh, snarky there. So um, eight and seven, uh-huh. two vehicles that are both scored the same. So 47% would buy the Cadillac again. 46% would buy these two vehicles and they are actually from the same parent company, and they are on the same platform, and that is number eight, the Jeep Renegade, and number seven, the Jeep Compass. I'm surprised by the Renegade, because I, I kind of like that car. I'm not surprised by the Compass, uh, but I am surprised by the Renegade. Uh, and they just um, they just refreshed the Compass. I was at Chicago when they rolled out, you know, they made it look more like the like the Grand Cher- Cherokee, or the Cherokee, versus like the down market Compass. So, <sighs> Renegade, huh? What are we going to say about the Renegade? The Renegade um, was America's darling until uh, the Bronco Sport came along and kind of out-Renegated and out-off-road yeah, the, that's a good the point. Renegade. You know what I mean? It's yep. just, it just more space, better off-road, <laughs> uh, more... It's uh, bigger, though, than the it, Renegade. Yeah, it's bigger. It's yeah. more like the Compass size, yeah. isn't, it? isn't it? I think that it's Compass size. Yeah, I'm going with that. Yeah. Bronco Sport so is so Renegade, Renegade is also, like, I'm not going to say this, Kirk, because I know it's on our list. Renegade was Echo Sport. Right, which yeah. is also on our list anyway. There you go. We just gave that one away. Yeah, that was way down there, though. Well, that one is certainly, that one anybody could have guessed at. But anyway, uh, uh, I don't know. You know, uh, there was a time when I actually, like, was thinking about buying uh, a long-term Renegade for review. Uh, but there's just nothing that compelling about it, right? It was built on the same chassis as a Fiat 500 uh, X. Uh, so I think it was like uh, like a, a, a jeepified version of a European Fiat, and I think that's the biggest problem, right? They went cute and cuddly with it, uh, as opposed to rugged and uh, off-roady. That would be my my reason. I think if they had made it more like a Jimny, uh, and less like a Fiat 500X, they would have been much better. So I, I think it was a Fiat that got turned into a Jeep. That's an interesting analysis there. I think that you you hit a lot of the things that I would probably discuss, but I think there are some good things about it. It was fairly good value. Uh, it's got a pretty compelling little engine. That 1.4 turbo is pretty fun. The, the multi-air? You could get it for a while there with the manual transmission. Best which thing was, about that engine is the name. <laughs> you could get it for a while there with the manual transmission, which was a really nice little feature. Mm. Uh, tow hooks had the Trailhawk trim, which was uh, very kind of rugged. And, and you, you know what I always like bug me about or bugs me about that vehicle? The yeah. fake low range. Yeah, but the Compass has that too. Yeah. And I think it's becoming more and more common. You right. see so, that pretty often. So it says low range. There's a little button. And uh, what uh, it does is really just lock the vehicle in first gear. So a true low range takes the engine's power and set, channels it through a different set of gears. So it increases the torque. It increases the power. Uh, it makes it uh, much more off-road worthy. All this does is lock it in first gear. So, I, you know, it's like having a fake hood scoop. I'm kind of like, you know, like, if you're going to go there, just go there and don't pretend to go there. 
I don't think anyone on the Consumer Reports data probably cares much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think, and probably, I think I, the Consumer Reports members are, I mean, are not the ones that would use the low range. I mean, I so can, I, can, I think that probably that's probably less important. But certainly things like um, quality could could come into play. Features value. Yeah, I guess you're right. I mean, so you're sitting in like uh, at that time when it was being developed, the FCA boardroom, right? And they're like, hey. Uh, we'll put a button there that locks into first gear, but we'll call it low range. Uh, and then somebody says, but it's not real low range. And somebody else says, you think that the buyers in this segment are going to care? I've been watching that show. We and you have been watching it. American Auto. Is it American Auto? The show about the American car industry. I don't remember what it's called. Uh, it's pretty fun. It's Payne. It's the name of the company. And for some reason, they've decided that they, they can't obviously design their own cars. So they've been taking FCA products like the 300. Ah. Uh, why don't you Google it and you can tell them what it's called. I think it's American Auto, uh, and they've been they've been like 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 just rebranding them as Payne P A Y N E cars, uh, and it's hilarious. I just love watching the cars that they have, and they did a one called a Pika in the last episode, which was this, and they're trying to build a car for ten thousand dollars, Tommy. American Auto, yep, that's yeah, what it's yeah. called. It's like um, uh, I don't know how you do it. like kind of it's like, like a, it's like it's like the office except around the auto industry. Yep, but it's pretty goofy. You know, I think it's kind of cool. I think it gets a lot of things right. And by the way, if, if any of you are on the show or writers on the show, all of our friends uh, always get a big kick out of it when you, like in this last episode uh, with the Pika, they mentioned Car and Driver. They did a Car and Driver review. Oh. And, so, and so whenever they do something like that, I think they did Autoblog like two episodes ago. So whenever you guys use like Autoblog or Car and Driver, all the, all the journalists at those organizations just get a big smile on their face so thank you for thinking of us and looking at the um this is interesting if you the rotten tomatoes yeah um the critics loved it absolutely loved it and the audience absolutely hated it really yeah that's a bad combination it's a bad combo what's, what's the what's what's the tomato meter 32 for the critics for the audience what you, what's what's the critics 100 wow the critics loved it so moving on down the list from the jeep renegade and the jeep compass um but what about the compass we haven't well, talked about that. I mean, it's kind of a worse renegade. Whoa. Well, I hate to say it, but it is. It's the Are same you platform. It's like straight to rent a car? No, it's uh it's the same platform, but it's longer and heavier and, and less dynamic. <sighs> yeah, you I know. I mean, what makes the renegade kind of interesting is it's small and kind of lightweight and nimble, and then the compass takes all that and just, so just you, squishes it. So you have a friend, we won't mention her name. Um because, uh, well, I don't want to mention her name. You, 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 I don't want to call her out or anything, but you're, you are welcome to mention her name. And she owns one of the cars on this list. She just bought it. Uh, and I think, I think she also owned, didn't you own a Compass before? Well, she had the, the, she had the worst Compass ever made, though. It was like a 2009, which was, <laughs> which was basically a Dodge Caliber. So what, what Jeep did was, right, they took the magic, or what they still do, they take the magic of the Wrangler, uh, and the magic of the name and all that it conjures up, right? When you think of Jeep, you think of, first of all, the World War II Jeep, right? American GIs storming Nazis and, you know, kicking ass and, you know, knocking down doors and just uh, winning the war. So you take that brand heritage and then you amplify it with the outdoor adventure lifestyle, right? Where you see like mud or snow or dust flying as, as you know, Wranglers and Grand Cherokees are flying across Moab. And they took that magic sauce and they sprinkled it on a bunch of different cars that, let's be, let's be real, really don't have that magic in them. And I think, I think the Compass and perhaps the Renegade are two of those vehicles. Even though, I do have to say, uh, we did a video maybe a couple of years ago where um, FCA, Stellantis now, has a proving ground in Chelsea, Michigan. And we got to go on the off-road course. And we did take a Renegade through some pretty interesting deep mud. And it was kind of fun. And, and I, we've done Dude, I Love My Rides where people have lifted them and people have put on... Uh, bigger, uh, more off-road worthy tires and slapped on max tracks on the roof and, you know, snorkeled them. So you can make them pretty, you know, pretty off-road worthy. But to this day, except for the Japanese, which is weird, but true, there's really no small, true off-roader that I can think of with a low range. Is there such a thing as a, like a Jimny we don't get? I mean, in America, is there like a compact or a subcompact true off-roader? What was the Japanese you were thinking of? Any of them, a Pajero, the little, the little K car, Pajero. Oh, any of those. Those were like, like the they had snorkels and low ranges and all that cool stuff. The Subarus, right? The Mitsubishis, all those. Is there a small true off roader that we would consider like Moab worthy in the best sense, where you could go anywhere like a Wrangler or a Bronco? Maybe the closest you get is really the Bronco Sport. So if you, well, <laughs> I mean, if you want to like compare 
old Japanese vehicles to old American vehicles, if you go back to like the 40s and 50s, there were a lot of them. Like the, the CJ2A was a little tiny thing. I mean, the FJ range. was tiny. The original one was Yeah, also small. very small. Yeah. Uh, and the CJ5 was really small too. So yeah, we've done them. But no, the no, I mean, original Scout was really tiny. If you wanted to buy a compact or subcompact off-roader that you could mod and do things that you can do with like a Wrangler or a Bronco, none of that, that doesn't exist, does it? Even the Japanese have walked away from them though in a big way. I mean, and even apparently, like the, I mean, the Jimny is a good example. That's a great one. But apart from that, how about not, the Duster? Did, does that have a low range? No. Hmm. Nope. But like even trucks, right? Like now there's two subcompact trucks, the Maverick and, of course, um, the Santa Cruz, and neither of them have a low range. And I, I keep going back to low range people who are like not into off-roading must think I'm crazy. You know, I, I'd be thinking to myself, is a low range that critical? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's the one thing that I think separates an off-roader from an on-roader. I think, though, it's important to realize that it, we're in a, a very specific world here. We're in a very off-road oriented mindset where we have big rocks and big mountains. Mm. So the low range is the standard. But for a lot of people, they, they don't really care about hitting the trails. They just want all-wheel drive for the snow, and they just want to maybe hit some dirt roads. And you don't need a low range for that. You uh, really I, don't. And the issue with the low range is you have to have a transfer case, right? And transfer cases are extremely heavy. So if you look at like a vehicle that had a low range and then didn't, like the Volkswagen Touareg, it lost like 400 pounds when it went from a two-speed transfer case to a single speed. So I, I w I'm going to be more a pragmatic journalist here, and I'm going to say that once upon a time, even Subaru, remember that old DL? They had, they had low ranges, and the reason they went away from them was not because of weight. It was just because of cost. It's a lot cheaper to throw a bunch of software at it, right, where you use the triple secret X mode or, you know, pick your, pick your multi-terrain select system where you basically use the brakes to stop the wheel that normally would spin in loose sand or snow or dirt and then send power to the one that has traction. And that is a solution that will get you unstuck, you know, half the time. But if you really want to seriously go to Moab and go off-roading or if you really want to, like, do, you know, bug out, right, and go into the great American Wild West, there will come a point where you're going to want a low range. Yeah, but that's assuming that people want to go into the American West. Right, once again, <laughs> I think again, a lot I, of people, people they don't but, care, but, Dad. They people, just want to like no, drive people, along in the snow. People buy cars for five percent of the time that, that they're actually going to use them. Yeah, and but so, which is why the Subaru marketing is so brilliant because people buy Subarus and they 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 see it going through the snow and on dirt roads, and then that's what they buy it for. And then they never maybe hit the dirt roads, but they ha at least have the clearance to go through the snow. So so once upon a time, I owned. Uh, I told a story last. Two podcasts ago, right? I owned a Samurai. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I actually did uh, get to use the low range in that thing, and I never went out west. <laughs> when well, did on you that same it? trip when I went to Washington, D.C., the year that I was there, for some reason, like, D.C. got, like, pummeled with a lot of snow. Yep. Uh, and I would go out, and I would try to, like, pull cars with this little tiny car that weighed, like, what? The Samurai weighed, what? Two and a half thousand pounds, whatever it was. Less right? than that, eighteen hundred or something. Eighteen, which is not like a, a, you know, you're not going to like pull a cutlass out with, which is what I was doing at the time with a little samurai. But with the low range, you could amplify the power. So I had a strap. I would strap it to the back of the super, uh, to the Suzuki, to the uh, sidekick. Not the sidekick, the uh, samurai. We actually also had a sidekick. Remember the sidekick? So I think you, you weren't around this, before this, I know the psychic. The issue with this argument, Dad, is right. first of all, no vehicles now have places to tow from, anyways. I mean, a Forester doesn't have a place to tow from, anyways. Is, is, that, is that a is that a is that a Toyota Tundra uh, reference? And if you were, if you are pulling up boom, boom, boom. caprices from ditches, it's probably cutlasses. Yeah, 1987. I just think that the time has moved on, and there's a select few vehicle that need the low range. Like the the Rangers of the world, the Broncos of the world. But but my point is, but it doesn't with, need to be like the standard. With a Samurai, I could pull out a much bigger, much heavier car with a low range, right? That I couldn't do with regular because it amplifies the power that that little tiny 1.3 liter. What yeah, yeah. 1 .3 if you liter. want to tow a Cutlass, this is your consumer advice for the day. Don't then don't use your don't then don't use your Forester. But uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised with what you can do without it. I think like I I've realized in the last few weeks that we probably harp on vehicles too much for the capability that a lot of people don't need. And there are still out there. Like, there's one crossover in the small segment that does have a low range if you want the true off-roader. The Jeep Cherokee with the Trailhawk is a real low range. So it's still around. You can still buy one. But for the most folks, I think a Santa Cruz or a Tucson will be just fine. 
All right, well, let's go to number, are we at number five yet? Uh, six is the Infinity QX50. 46% of people would buy it again. Whew, QX50, a rebranded, uh, what is a QX50? What are they rebrand? What's the Nissan that they rebranded? Help me here. I, um, I don't know. <laughs> well, it's a Rogue, right, basically. Is it a Rogue? Is the 60 the, the Pathfinder? Once again, this is a new, another vehicle. We don't. <laughs> we should know more about that. We you do. Know, uh, uh, here's the thing about Infinity, right? Infinity has gone through a lot of different brand and name changes. Once upon a time, right, there was the M. Now it's the Q. Now it's the QX. It, 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 the, the, the nomenclature is all over the map, uh, and I think I think Infinity has just a really uh, bad issue right now with branding. I think most people have a, would have a hard time telling you what an infinity stands for, right? Uh, and um, once upon a time, when I remember, you know, when infinity first came out, along with Acura and along with Lexus, the brand was kind of the BMW of, um, of, 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 of the Japanese world. You know what I'm saying? They, yep. they, they focus like the FX35. Remember the FX35? Yeah, it's cool. The FX50, remember that car? The Shark Tooth FX50, that was like a bigger version of the 35, I believe. Wasn't it the same car with different right, engines? Right, yeah, bigger engine, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, I was like, that was like, you know, that was cool. And you understood what it was, and it was like, you know, an X5M. Uh, now with the QX50, I, I, I honestly, uh, I, I'll admit this. I, I, I think it's a Rogue. I think I figured it out. Okay, I don't, I don't really even know where it like fits in with the Infiniti. Um, and I'll be honest about this, their, their SUV crossover lineup. Well, let's... I know the Happy Hippo, right? That's... Um, this is why I wanted to do some more research before the podcast. I, my dad came walking into my office and said, we're going to go do a podcast. And I said, oh, no. We need to be prepared. I'm so sorry. Um, so I, I, guess, I guess I'm deflecting uh, blame here by, by kind of saying infinity... So, you, so, okay, I got it. So the, the 50 is the little one. It starts at 39. Right. So that's like, I think, the Audi Q5 competitor. Okay. And then it goes QX55, which is the coupe version of the 50... Right. And then it goes QX60, which is brand new. That is the uh, Pathfinder. And then it goes QX80, which is the Armada. Hey, I, like, I kind of like the stand test. Maybe we can make that into a video. You know, when you walk up to your friend Stan and you say, hey, Stan, I just bought a new car. And you say, I bought an Infiniti, what is it? QX50. What would Stan say? Well, I don't have a friend named Stan. Well, if you had a friend. Well, okay. <laughs> if I had a friend. Let's call Sarah. What would Sarah say? Um, she would she'd be very excited. She'd be like, "What the hell's that?" No, she would be like, "Wow, what a cool car!" And then she would comment about the nice touchscreen and the comfy leather. That's what she would say. Would you, so she's a big car gal, Sarah. Well, she just likes. I'm just saying, Stan would be like, "What is that?" I think like there that's a, the Stan test is a good thing for like brand awareness. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of people that don't know the brand, but they get in the car and they can still appreciate the quality. And Infinity does bring a lot of quality to the table. They've got a lot of luxury, a lot of kind of decently nice tech, um, good leathers, and they're pretty good value. For example, the QX50 starts at $39,000. So I think that there's more than, than just the brand awareness that goes into a good car. Okay. I'm, I'm not QX50. Gonna, I'm not gonna, is there anything else you want to say about it? No, I'm, I'm, I'm frantically looking on the website, seeing <laughs> if there's anything else that's, that's notable. Look, I, I think if there's one thing we know about uh, that we've learned from, from you guys out there and about car buyers is that, that cars that have a personality uh, right now are in high demand. So anything that, that is... Uh, you know, either super fast or super off-roady or super expensive. Basically, non-wallflower cars are just really sought after. People want the car to express who they are. And I think that the one thing about this list that, that uh, besides the fact that a lot of them are crossovers, that is true, is that they're just kind of cars that provide basic transportation. Some may be um, affordable, some may be expensive, some may be... Um, Reliable, so maybe not so, but none of them actually like like make a, any kind of a, a statement when they you know drive down the road outside of the fact that you know you bought a car to drive to work. So next up on the list, before we get to the next up on the list, actually, I do want to take a brief pause and do a quick bit of automotive history. So on this day, which is on the recording January thirteenth, twenty twenty two, Ford debuted its soybean car. 
Really? Yeah, very cool stuff. This comes from well, automotivehistory.org. So what, what, what is a soybean car? Oh, there you go. Uh, well, Ford built a car made out of recycled, uh, no, sorry, agricultural plastic. Oh. So they built a car entirely out of soybean, wheat, corn, and um, hemp. And it was pretty cool. So this was back in 1942, so it was, um, you know, war era here in the U.S. It was said to be 30% lighter than steel. And it ran on hemp fuel, which is pretty cool. You're probably thinking, why did Ford build a soybean prototype? Well, three reasons, as um, quoted by the Henry Ford Museum. Uh, first, old man Ford was big into agriculture. Okay. And he wanted a clever way to integrate agriculture and the automotive industry. Um, he thought it was a safer material than steel. And this is an interesting one. The metal shortage during World War II, of course, prompted manufacturers to get creative with... C could you eat the car? I don't think it was edible. Oh. No, I, I don't think it was edible. Could, could, like, a cow eat the car? I don't think a cow could okay. eat it either. Well, that's that's a shame because after it, that would have a second life then, wouldn't it? And they only built one prototype, and they were working on a second one <laughs> before. Did the cow eat it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Billy, if you look at, like, what happened in the mid-40s, Ford was basically um, contracted to, to help with the war effort. Uh -huh. So the soybean car kind of fell fell into the wayside, and then eventually it was crushed. And rumors are that it, it actually wasn't made out of soy. Apparently, like, they may have cheated a little bit with what it was made out of. But the soybean car was a cool idea. Kind of looks like a 1940s, um, I don't know, clock. But it was built, and now you know. They built a soybean car. All right, can I do my rant now? Another one? We haven't done a rant yet. It's been all rants. This show has been entirely <laughs> made out of rants. No, this is my rant. Uh, so me and you have been watching uh, Perry Dakar, right? Okay, yep. Uh, and, and the one thing I'm, I'm always amazed at... Um, and, and don't maybe maybe you know maybe I don't, maybe they're not doing full coverage, but I'm always amazed at like how many flat tires the cars get. It doesn't seem like motorcycles because they don't have spare tires. So either they don't the motorcycles don't get them because they don't carry them, or if they do get them, uh, they have some other way of fixing them, right? Sure. But but it seems like the cars are always losing time to flat tires. Mm -hmm. So uh, my rant is at this point, you know, I, like I was at the Geneva Auto Show like 10 years ago where they introduced a non-rubber tire. Isn't there something better out there off-road, especially when like, like seconds, let alone minutes count, that would prevent these vehicles from getting a flat tire? Isn't there any kind of technology that's better than rubber, right? The, the, the tire tech has not basically changed since Firestone and Ford hung out uh, around the campfires, you know, in Michigan. Why don't we have something better than than rubber tires that that end up you know getting flats and and God on those trucks? Imagine changing one of those tires. Well, I think radial tires was a pretty pretty good invention compared okay. to bias ply. Right. Well, what, what would you make? What would you use instead of rubber? So well, they have. You've seen. I mean, I keep. So I've seen now wheels and tires that roll not just you know forward but sideways. So have you seen that? Have sure. You seen those? But those are they're like round, they're like round balls that you can like roll. I mean, here's the thing, right? And, you, and, and you, I've seen like wheels that, that use, like the space buggy uses them, right? Instead of rubber, they have components that, that are elastic, but then can't be flat flattened, right? So, for example, there's the twill. The twill. Yeah, was, the twill. The issue, Dad, I think, is that a lot of the vehicle's suspension um, comes in the form of the tire compression. The air in the tire. Yeah. I mean, air is a, is a pretty good <laughs> substance that's suspending a vehicle. So I think that's a pretty big, big deal when you're out. I remember when. We could you imagine? Like, could you imagine? What is your favorite thing, right? When you're off road, you like to air down, right? right? So you get bigger contact. No, I patch. hate to air down, but anyway. Well, yeah, but for your back, you need to air down because it, it makes it a lot more comfortable right. to get a bigger contact patch. And then you spend two hours airing back up. But anyway. So imagine, not not only not being to air down, but running at a hundred psi. That was what it would be like to ride on a, on a perfectly rubber wheel. It'd be terrible. It'd well, just be... Well, when, like, when we sent the buggy to the moon, that didn't have tires. Look, look you, use one of those two computers to Google the moon buggy. I'm Feels sure it had some kind of tire. It did not have tires. Uh, let's see what they were made out they of. Were, First of all, you don't have a lot of weight, though. You don't have a lot of weight because you're less gravity. You're in... Um, I don't think those were tires. Uh, Bridgestone just, tires. Uh, what did the moon buggy have? Who made the lunar rover Goodyear? Were they tires? Were they rubber tires or were they something else? The the Goodyear, it was like a mesh tire. It was right, like a, it was like a mesh thing, right. That's what I remember. But you're also in much lower gravity, and the moon buggy was a little light thing. But I, I just I just think that there's got to be a, a better, newer technology. Like, like to me, the, the best thing that's happened in tire tech is we tested it last year. 
uh, is the new Cross Climate brand of tires that uh, Bridgestone's doing there. A lot of manufacturers are doing them, basically all weather tires. So if you haven't heard of this yet, the problem with snow tires is that they basically come to life at 44 degrees. Uh, above 44, they start to burn off. They're, the, the compound just disintegrates in hot temperature. So you have to swap them out. And let's face it, Tommy, you know when your mom wants us to swap out the, the tires on the X5 for snow tires, do you know how much you love that? Yeah. It, I mean, it, it takes <laughs> 35 minutes. Don't you dread it? No, you dread, it's not a go. long process. I know you got you, you to drag them out of the basement. So here's They're filthy. The, then you got to throw them in the car. Then you got to take them to Discount Tire. And then you got to come back to Discount Tire, <laughs> take the old ones, filthy, drag them down to the basement. It's not a 35 minute process. It's it's a whole day thing. And with these new all weather tires, what you end up with is a tire that has like 90 percent of the snow capability, but you can just leave on all year round. But I don't think it's a very good tire. No, well, the problem we had when a Tesla with it was <laughs> it made the ride very harsh. Like, there's no such thing as a perfect tire. You just cannot get around physics, right? So, yes, you could run it in the summer. Yes, you could run it in the winter. Um, but the issue is it was pretty good in the winter. It was okay in the summer. But the net result of that was that it rode like a like a wheelbarrow. Yeah, so, but once upon a time, like when I had my old 300 ZX, right, it had a little switch that would uh, change the suspension from sport to normal to, uh, to comfy, to comfort, right? Sure. And, and in comfort, it was wallowy. In sport, it was like dry your teeth out. And in normal, it was usable. And basically, that switch was useless because you didn't want to touch it. Right. But now, with our adaptive electronic suspension, you can get a car or a truck uh, that, that does all that <coughs> Sorry, at the push of a button, right? But so why can't we improve the tire in the same way? Why c- you want like an adaptive tire where you if can, we can like have push a, suspen- a button and it's soft and push yeah. the button? If we can have a suspension that does it all, why can't we have a tire that does it all? You're saying you have to have dedicated snows, you have to have dedicated mud terrains, you have to have dedicated summer or performance tires. I'm saying why can't we build a tire that does it all? Because there's only so many things you can change. You can change the compound, you can change the tread block, you can change the material. I don't know. And the next Mr. Musk out there, and figure last, out the better tire. Last time I checked, unless something's gone terribly wrong, your suspension is not propelling you down the road. So it's kind of a different can of worms. No, but I'm saying it, it, they, they were able to make a suspension that does it all, where you could have it firm for the track, you can have it soft for off-road, you can have it comfortable for the road. Uh, but a tire, you, you, uh, until these all-weather tires came along, you really couldn't have a tire. And it's super confusing. It's also environmentally horrendous because, you know, the tires end up being, right, you're only using the compound, and then 90% of the tire, once you're done with it, is still there. And what do you do with it? You have to go recycle it. Yeah, recycle and, it. And I don't believe they're being recycled. I think they're probably being, you know, they say they recycle them into, like, a uh, compound to put into cement so that the road is more rubbery, but I bet you a lot of those are just getting burned or, you know, thrown so, in landfills. So you want a better tire? Is that what you're... I want something where you don't throw 90% of it away. Okay. I think that's a fair rate. <laughs> that's okay. All right. What's, what, what are we at now? What number? Um, number five is the Nissan Rogue Sport. 42% would buy it again. This is... This was kind of a weird one. It was a, like a smaller version of the Nissan Rogue. Abroad, it was called the Qashqai or the Kashki. And they brought it to the U.S. Wasn't that the Kicks? Nope. The Sport was a cash guy? Yep. All right, so the Kicks goes below it. The Kicks is smaller. Oh, yeah. The um, kind of buying point that the uh, Rogue Sport brought to the table was that it was pretty cheap and it had all-wheel drive. And it went on the program. And that, that's there's not much more beyond that that would cause me to want to buy a Rogue Sport, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, it's it's you a- are right that... that and this is why this is a very unsatisfying list. If I was listening to this, I would be unsatisfied with this podcast. Why? Because the cars are just unsatisfying cars. There's a reason they're on the list, right? I I just think that they're pretty dull. Yeah, I think a lot of people own these cars. I think they maybe, do. Maybe but the people who own these cars don't listen to this podcast. Well, yeah, there's not a lot of Rogue Sport listeners probably out there. It's like it's a fine car. It's pretty cheap. It's um, got all-wheel drive available. But it's CVT. It's slow. It doesn't handle very well. The tech is kind of eh. I mean, let's take a popular brand like right the uh, the Rav Four or the Rogue, right, which is very popular, and let's just shrink it and make it cheaper and de- decontent it uh, and call it the Sport uh, to give it you know pizzazz. The most the most sporty thing about the Sport is the name. I have a friend who just bought one of these, and um, she surprisingly loves it. She's really happy with it, mm-hmm. but she doesn't care about cars. She just wants to drive it and have it last forever. And it probably will. That's one thing about so maybe, what percentage of people would buy it again? Uh, 42. So maybe she's one of the 58 that, uh, wouldn't buy it again or would buy it again. 
Forty-two um, percent would buy it again. So she's she's 50, one of those she's one of those forty-two percent that would buy it again. That's how you said it's done. Yes, you're right. Forty-two percent. She is one of the forty-two. Forty-two percent. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think she'd buy it again. She just, <laughs> she just wants a car to, to. I mean, if a car came that long that was cheaper with all-wheel drive, that was also the same size. She'd she'd buy that instead. So she cared about like Colorado weather and all-wheel drive. And what was on the used car lot. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, in this market. Yeah. So next up, and this is the car that kind of does baffle me because I think this car is interesting, but it just kind of gets outshined by its German competition, the Infiniti Q50. So this is the sporty sedan. Finally, we got an interesting car on the list. Woohoo! <laughs> I, I want to launch the Q50, so I know the Q50. 40% of people would buy it again. So fewer people would buy this again than the uh, Nissan. <laughs> Nissan. Well, what do you think of the Q50? I like the Q50. Yeah. I think the tech is a mess. It's got those dual screens, which is just terrible. But especially the Red Sport model is huge fun. I drove it off-road. The, the problem with the Q50 is the Genesis, right? Genesis is kind of yeah. Ge that's Genesis true. is kind of uh, going where Infinity went, and they're doing it with more style, more pizzazz, and probably more value. Uh, and so sure. Now, so now Infinity not only is having to you know outsell and you know ha take. Take um, a beating from Lexus and Audi and Mercedes, but they're also kind of having to fight off Genesis, which is up and coming and it's kind of going after, trying to eat their lunch, right? It's, it's a great point, yeah. yeah. But very fun engine, twin turbo V6. I drove it off road. That didn't that didn't surprise you? Yeah, and I love the fact that at least there's some like you know, as Nathan would say, it's got some lead in the pencil. Aren't you going to ask why I drove a sports sedan? Like, off why did you drive a sports sedan <laughs> off road? Because I went on this program and they had a rally cross area cool. for the Q50 and then the coupe version, the Q60. And they let us tear it up on gravel, which was pretty cool. That was kind of an unusual thing that you don't see very often. But I think it's a gorgeous looking car. Not many people appreciate how good looking it is. Um, I, I know that like it, it does get its, its clocks cleaned in a lot of ways by value from, from the Koreans. But it's a fun car to drive. The tech is a mess. And I don't know about the reliability. I mean, reliability could... I'd like to know why people thought these cars were unsatisfying. I'd like to know more about the data. Go to Consumer Reports. Yes. Or become a member, because I think you have to pay to get a lot of their content, okay. unless you buy the magazine. All right. But, um, yeah, I, that's, it's a shame that, that it's on this list, because it's one of the few fun cars on the list. They like to say on their podcast that they are a nonprofit for members. So, yeah, they, they do good work. So they do interesting work. Um, are we at the top three yet? Yeah, number three and number two are some truly dreary cars. All right, let's let's get the, the top three. Go for it, Tommy. What's number three? Number, Surprise me. Number three is the Chevrolet Trax, so back to the crossover world. Just 37% of folks would buy it again. The Trax is a weird one because... I've never driven the Trax, Tommy. Oh, I have driven you the Trax. You have. I, I think you did a, 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 a slip test on it, didn't you? I did not, but I have driven one. I have never driven a Trax. It's, so. it's uh, basically a little itty-bitty crossover. You probably wouldn't like it because it's very small. Chevy tracks. Yeah. I like small cars. You know that. <laughs> I, I love small cars. That is, yeah, that is arguable. I have a mini SE that I drive as a daily driver. That's about as small as it gets in America. You, you drive it, but not as a daily driver. And you won't put I, 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 If I didn't have... Look, okay. I drive it as a daily <laughs> you driver. You drive the Grand Cherokee more than the Mini. No, I drive because it's snowing and it's got four-wheel drive. But when we got oh, it, I drove it every... Oh, something. No, no, no. I mean, my job <laughs> is to drive a whole bunch of different cars, right? That's my job. So, But I would be perfectly happy to drive the uh, Mini SE, the all-electric Mini, as a daily driver... Uh, and if I owned it like a regular person where it becomes a daily driver where I don't have a fleet of cars that I have to review as part of my job or I can drive because we've got all these classics, I would throw some snow tires on it, which it's missing, and I would drive it all year round. Hmm. I'm a little suspicious. Mm, that's fine. I remember we went on a uh, on a two hour drive in my classic mini, and you said you couldn't do that again. <laughs> Come on, your classic mini. That that's a world mm -hmm. apart from the SE. Uh huh. Oh my gosh! I think we have a fake small first, car fan over first, here. First folks. of all, the classic mini is half the size. Keep in mind, I am it's six two and well size. over two hundred pounds. Yeah, it's the perfect size. It's, it does exactly <laughs> what you need it to do. You barely fit in that thing. It's a great little. I, I have to. I have to pretzel myself just to get into it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Lots of excuses and then, here. And then it's uh, what is it? Is what, what what side do you drive it on? The right. Yeah, exactly. So whenever we go through a drive up, I'm the one who has to do all the hard <laughs> heavy lifting. <laughs> You don't ride in it very often because you say it's too small. Yes, it is too small. It's not too small. It's 10 feet long. It's How tall are you? It's super fun. The rule of thumb is if the car is longer than you are tall, it's the perfect size, but just a little bit. What car is that? Every car is longer than you are taller. But Unless it's a clown car. If the car is more than twice as long as you are tall, 
It's too big. Okay. All Minis right. 10 feet you, long. These are, these are millennial rules I've never heard <laughs> these of. These are my new rules. Yeah, but making them up on the yeah. spot. But the Chevy Trax. Yeah, what about it? It's just a, a kind of a cheaply made, very compact crossover, which was not very interesting to drive. It did have all-wheel drive. Is it, is it, a, is it like De, is it a Daewoo that you know? I'm, I'm, it may have been a Korean vehicle, yeah, actually. Is it like a Korean that vehicle? Because Chevy, I think, bought Daewoo. Yeah, it is. Yep, South, yeah. South Korea. That's yeah, a great, great so, point there. There you go. But um, not incredible value for what it is. And then it was made completely relevant by its new uh, competitor, the Chevrolet Trailblazer. So the Chevrolet launched the Trailblazer, also a Korean vehicle, but it had a lot of personality and charm, and it had these cool little three-cylinder turbo engines. And not, not to be confused by the Blazer. No, not the Blazer. The Trailblazer, the little one. That, I like the Trailblazer. And it looked Blazer. cool, and it was kind of aggressive and sporty and off-roady, and the, the tracks is just kind of a lump. So I, I can understand why that's on the list. And same class, um, same thing can be said about the next vehicle on our list. Also an import from another country, but made by a, a domestic, the Ford EcoSport. I think there could be an argument made that that is one of the worst cars in America. It is a very bad car. <laughs> <laughs> not much to, good to say about the Echo Sport. Yeah, uh, it feels cheaply made. I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying from a driver's point of view, it feels cheaply made. Um, it this, is gutless. It's discontinued, right? In, they just yeah, killed it's, it. In its base form, uh, the infotainment, I dare not even call it that, the screen looks like a Casio watch from 1984. Um, the um, surprisingly expensive when you load it up. It's surprising, it's like started at like twenty, but you can go up to like twenty-seven when you get the one with the actual screen on it. I will give you this. I think the Echo Sports is. Um, I like the smile, the small. I like the fact, but it's very bad <laughs> use of space. The best thing about the Echo, Ec well, the name is horrible. Is it Eco Echo Sport? or Eco Sport? Yeah. Come on, Ford, figure it out. Uh, and then the best thing about it is a spare tire. No, they got rid of that. There you go. They got rid of the best thing, so now there's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so they had this cool uh, rear swing gate mounted spare tire, but that is no longer around. That is no longer around. Uh, you know, it, it kind of feels like um, like like a car that uh, Payne would make. <laughs> I'm talking about Payne. You know, yeah, Payne Automotive, the the, the fictitious car company. Uh, so maybe maybe they should have taken that and rebranded it as a Pika for all you. For all you American auto fans, you right. know what I'm talking about. I may have to come clean on something. You may have been right this entire podcast. What? Because the top three cars, yeah. the top three least satisfying cars, yeah. are all tiny crossovers. Hmm. So maybe you got something about the size. Maybe I was wrong this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> um, because the number one car on the list coming right, let in. Let me guess. I don't know what it is. At just 29%. Wow. Whoa. 29%. Would buy again. From uh, a brand that should be doing better. I don't know. What is it? I have no clue. Um, the Toyota CHR. Really? Oh, yes. Not, but it's funny because that competes directly with the Honda HRV. And the EcoSport and the Chevy Trax. Except the HRV has one thing that all those don't have, and that is space. <laughs> HRV is very roomy, actually. The inside. CHR. Isn't um, very I was roomy. talking to my buddy Alex Stikes, Alex Donatos. He was saying that as Toyotas go, the the, the reliability is kind of hit and miss on the CHR. You know what the biggest problem with that is? I mean, there's a lot of problems. So I was at the launch of that car, actually, at the Geneva Auto Show when they first unveiled it. So what they did was they took a car that was meant for Europe, where, as you say, people get the biggest car that they feel they can live with. And in Europe, that the, is probably... the smallest car they can the, live with. Okay, smallest. In America, biggest. So in Europe, that is probably like, you know, like, like the... Chevy Escalade, I mean the Cadillac Escalade of, <laughs> of the European. <laughs> so they unveiled it there, and then they brought it over here. But in Europe, it came as a hybrid. And a diesel. Diesel and all-wheel drive. Yeah. None then, of which made it here. So, that's so, true. So it, it, it came as this little uh, funky. Okay, I, I mean, it was, the design is good. But it was one of those like design <laughs> over functionality. Okay. So the sight lines were horrible. The back seat, like unless <laughs> unless you are, um, is the design good though? Let, let's let's go back to that first like, point I, you made. They did like a floating white roof. That's always good. So we like it because of the roof. But apart from the roof, yeah, I like I like the look of it. I <laughs> thought it was I thought it was like very, you know, once again, it's like it's like one of those cars like the like the Renegade, where they took a European model that absolutely does not fit into the American automobile scene and tried to squeeze it in. Uh, and the nice thing about Toyota is they realized it incredibly quickly and came up with its replacement, right, the Corolla Cross, which actually is oh, all-wheel yeah. drive, is big, and is more like an HRV Great in point. terms of size. And so now th that will sell. But I, I like the look of the car. But unless you didn't have legs, you could not sit in the back seat. The sight lines are horrendous. I mean, just absolutely horrendous. Very bad. It's underpowered. Yeah. Um, so it's pokey, um, and you know, it's it's 
It's kind of like if if it were like the FJ if the FJ wasn't badass and cool. Yeah, that was a good good analysis. I think you're pretty spot on there. You're I, being very kind to me today. Do you want something from me? Is there? Are you asking for time off? Tell no, me I'm what's, just. What's, I, what's going on I know here? people in the comments say bicker with you, so I'm trying to be more positive. All right, all right. Um, I and, just. And you want time off? <laughs> no, I would like some more time to prepare for the podcast, though, so I can brush up on my Kia Forte knowledge. Uh, right. But I am pretty well versed on the uh, CHR because I've driven it a bunch of times. And it's, it's a very kind of dull car to drive. It does have a very small four-cylinder naturally aspirated engine. It looks like it should be kind of quick and zippy, and it just isn't. You killed it on the all-wheel drive analysis. If you're buying a small crossover, I think a lot of folks that live in snow country, this just does not meet their needs. There's one way you could save it. What? Make it a convertible. Yeah, no, that's a horrible <laughs> idea. Although you could make it cool if you gave it a turbo and an all-wheel drive system and a manual. That'd be very cool. And one and, thing that we should say, which is good about it. And put the letters WRX on the back. <laughs> <laughs> it does have um, a good standard suite of safety gear, right? Toyota yeah. safety suite. So you it's know, got it's got the important safety gear in it, um, the uh, adaptive cruise control. You know, it's like a less funky juke. Yeah, but worse because the juke had a turbo. And this yeah, juke had a turbo and it was all-wheel drive. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, but yeah I it, think it's in that good. same kind of like – and it had some cool motorcycle design – you know, styling points. I just think that this is a little weird looking. I mean, I know they kind of updated it recently, but it's just not, it doesn't work. Yeah, I, I mean, like you said, turn it into a rally car and follow the, you know, I think Juke probably did sell more. Uh, but yeah, I, I think when people, I think the thing that probably did kill that is it's just so cramped inside, so dark, sight lanes are miserable. Uh, and so it's just a kind of car that, that is very, uh, uh, unusable, right? There's no utility value in in that in that vehicle. World car though, they sell it from everywhere, from um, North America to the UK to China. It's, I mean, it's sold all over the world. Um, made in Japan, China, uh, Turkey, Thailand. So it's all over the world being yeah, produced. Yeah, like, like I say, when I was there, when they unveiled it in Europe at Geneva, right? Uh, I thought it was you know pretty cool, but then none of the cool stuff. The hybrid, and I think the hybrid gets really grand fuel economy. It was an all-wheel drive version of it. None of that came over here, so without the, that. Another car, by the way, that, that the Corolla Cross is, is kind of, I think it might be its replacement, like you said. Very yeah. practical. It's also a world car, but it just makes more sense for, I think, our market. It's going to do better. I, I strongly believe that. That's a better name, too, right? At least it's, like, it's got heritage. Yep. Yeah, it's a good, not, it's a good not name. Not three letters it's, put together in a random fashion. It's kind of boxy and square, so it should hold a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it should be good. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Consumer Reports, and thank you guys for watching. Uh, I want, did they do? And I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot here. I know I hate to do this. I wonder if they did the opposite of this list. Uh, the top ten most satisfying cars. Yeah, I wonder if uh, can you take a, can you Google that? See if Consumer Reports did that because that could be our next podcast. So that would be really interesting. Cars. We could see if if our theory that that the cars. The problem is it's going to be behind like a paywall, right? You, you probably won't be able to get to it. Unless you're a member oh, of the Tumor Report. become a member. Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. Yeah, I think it's probably worth it. But, so uh, does it exist? Does that top, list exist? Top 10 most satisfying cars updated January 4th. Oh, yes. It's you, up there. Do you see the cars? No. No. It's behind a paywall. That's hey, shit. Consumer Reports, send us a membership. We'll be glad I'll, to. I'll pay the few bucks. They do good work. Mm -hmm. But then can we tell these people without having them pay a few bucks? Yeah, I think Consumer Reports would appreciate getting this information out there. I mean, we're promoting Consumer Reports in this list, right? We're helping them grab more memberships, like if that is their goal, which I assume it is, because that means they can do more testing and buy more cars. You know, they buy a lot of cars, right? They, they do they, buy a they, lot they, of you cars. You know, the thing that happened on YouTube is a lot of YouTubers started buying cars, and we're kind of live on YouTube, so we started buying not a lot, but some cars. But Consumer Reports has always been buying their own cars. Uh, and just the logistics of buying and selling cars, that's a full-time job for somebody on staff. Oh, yeah. It's a big job. Right? And they do it. You know what they do? Uh, and I hope, hope they don't mind me saying this, but they do it anonymously. Wow, really? Yeah. So they, they like, they like they're, I, I guess they're reporters. I, I, I don't know what they call their correspondence. Uh, they take turns, I think, or they, they assign somebody to do it, and they go into dealerships and like, like anonymously buy the car hmm. so that, that, that the manufacturer or the dealer doesn't know it's going to go to Consumer Reports. I think that's... You know, if you want if you want unbiased uh, testing, having uh, an organization buy a car anonymously is, is about as good as it gets. That's going to be like the gold standard. I did find the list, and it is a very interesting list. Actually, they are they are interesting cars. You you want to do it next time? Maybe we will. All right, all right. Or do you want you want to just 
let these people know now? What, what would what would you be your preference? Uh, we can do it next time. Yeah, I think I think just enough to talk about here. All right, give me one of them. Just number ten. Uh, I don't have them in order, oh. but I do have. I'll give you one of them. This okay. is kind of in give the me middle. one of them. I'm just curious. Just give the me a little hint. MX-5 Miata. Yeah. Eighty nine percent. That's would we good. buy that car again? Apparently. I, uh, here, can I? I'm gonna wreck this, but I bet you, I bet you, I could nail nine. Of, I bet you, I could at least nail five of those. All right. Yeah, I've got a list of some of them. So. Okay. Uh, Chevy Corvette. Uh, yes, it's on there. Okay. Uh, let me think. Let me let me do. Let me put my thinking caps up. Miata, Chevy Corvette. I'm gonna do uh, BRZ eighty uh, six. Um, not on the 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 list I'm I'm looking at. No. No. Nope. All, right. All right. Well, I'm one. I, I'm, I get three strikes, so that's one strike. Okay, strike one. Uh-huh. So I'm one for one right now. All right. Uh, WRX. Nope. Two for two. F one fifty. Nope. All right, well, we'll have to do it next time. <laughs> I, guess I, I guess I wasn't as smart as I thought I was. You've owned two of the cars on the list. Oh, God, now you tell me. All right, well, you know, we'll, 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 we'll give you the list definitely next time. Whether the whole show based around it, I'm not sure, but we'll definitely give you the list. So thank you guys for joining us. I hope uh, that we're, we're trying to bicker less, like Tommy said, uh, because uh, some, of the, some of the reviews say we bicker too much. And by the way, if you like the show, please, we're really putting a lot of time, effort into it. Well, not today, because we were... Because we, you, know, you jumped me while I was about to do I, some well, important tell him, editing. Tell, I would tell him why I jumped you, because there was a reason for it. It wasn't just because I was like, hey, let's go do the podcast. Why? Why did I tell you that we have to do it today as opposed to when we usually do it? On, that's on Monday. I don't know. I was doing my 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 in depth research on the Acura RDX, which I was going to review. Because, because and you came swooping in. Because next week's a big week for us. Why? Oh, don't tell them. I want it to be a surprise. There's a vehicle that we've been trying. A very special vehicle. There's a very special vehicle that we've been trying to get. That we've been, you know, that that we finally managed to get our hands on. We're going to do a whole week of testing. We're going to do. Uh, drag racing. We're going to do a classic test that we do with it. We're going to do all kinds of really cool stuff. Probably even go to Moab with it. It's that significant. So I wanted to concentrate our efforts on that vehicle next week instead of uh, also, you know, kind of splitting our time between that and the podcast. So that's why I stormed into your office and I said, hey, let's, <laughs> let's do this podcast. All right. Sounds all right. good. All I, right. appreciate, I appreciate the explanation. And like I said, guys, Check out uh, tfl-studios.com if you want to get all of our – because I, I keep reading the comments and everybody's always like, I didn't know you did that review or I didn't. And, and, and I know we have seven YouTube channels and people think that that's too many, and I probably agree, but there's – we can talk – it's a whole other topic. We could talk about why we did that from a business standpoint uh, because, let's face it, like car and truck guys are different. Car and truck gals are different, so that's why we wanted to separate the content. But nevertheless, if you want to keep up with all of it, tfl-studios.com. Uh, it's not, uh, there's no monetization there. It's just we thought it'd be a nice place uh, for you to, to stay up on all the stuff that we do so that when inevitably do it, we do a review. Like Tommy did a really great review. So he did this review that we published uh, recently where he went and tried to compare whether a four wheel drive car like a Jeep Grand Cherokee uh, is as good in the snow as a two wheel drive car with traction aid. So we took a Honda Civic. Uh, and what we did, what you did, Tommy and Alex, was you, you got the snow socks, you got the snow chains, you got another device, and you compared stopping distances and acceleration in relatively deep snow to uh, an all-wheel drive car. And I'm reading the comments on that video, and everybody's like, well, why don't you try snow tires? And I keep thinking to myself, you know, we did that review last year. We did the snow tire review. Uh, and so, you know, how do you, you can't reply to every comment. You know, we did, we already done this. So that's why we have this one channel where you can go and you can actually see where everything is at. All right. Well, guys, we will catch you on the next video. And thanks for watching and thanks for listening. Uh, see you next time. Ciao. Bye.